York, New York. Meredith, we try to make this a little bit professional. This <laughs> sounds pretty good. Uh, like Meredith, <laughs> I just want to, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this is really, uh, uh, I'm new at this and I'm just going to shoot the bull. And I really appreciate you coming on, Meredith. And uh, really, this is my first time I really actually ever met you. So uh, I've seen your work. I know that people love you in New York. Uh, you're very, very popular. I know the players love you. I know the people upstairs love you, the Steinbrenners. So I know Michael Kay and uh, all those guys. And uh, I know one of your best friends is Susan o. Waldman. And uh, so I really appreciate you coming on. And I know it's not, uh, you know, I mean, it's not like what you're used to, but what else could you do? You know, me being Jewish, I like my candles. I uh, do my dreidel, and that's all I do. Yeah, so, Monica, I like it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. But again, thank you very much for coming on and, uh, you know, talking to the guys. And, you know, I talk to Marcus Tams all the time down in Yankee Fantasy Camp. I see uh, 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 David Wells, and I see uh, from Dwight Gooden to uh, Bucky Dent, and they love you. And, you know, they've been on the field with you. And you're so professional and, uh, and you have done something that I wish when I played baseball back in the day, it was, uh, it was more people like yourself on the field that could co communicate with the players like ourselves. Uh, the only thing that we actually had, we had a few camera people, uh, that's all we actually had. But you being so smart, now let me ask you a question now. You know, did you always love baseball when you're growing up? So this is pretty wild. Growing up, I grew up in a very basketball centric family. And while we watched baseball, it's not like it is now. It wasn't on every day of the week. It was game of the week and a few games thereafter. It just wasn't on as much. And I had two older brothers. So we were out playing softball, baseball, every sport you can imagine. But actually watching it, even playing it, I found it to be not high paced enough for me. I needed more action when I was real young, but it was only as I started getting older that I appreciated all the nuances of the game and that I really grew to love the game. And when I really fell in love with the game was a little bit later in life. I was a Phillies fan growing up. Uh, those were all the years, you know, with some of the fun teams that the Phillies had. But I got a job for a local cable station in the Allentown area, and they wound up getting the rights for the AA Reading Phillies, and I covered all their home games. Then they wound up getting the rights for the AAA team. So I was covering AA, AAA, and for a radio station I was working for in Philadelphia, I was actually covering the big league team a little bit as well for radio in a small capacity. So I almost had every level. Um, unlike some people, I loved the grind of it. I loved the relationships. I liked from my perspective that I would see a guy in double A get called up to the big leagues. And I, I was kind of making that same trek with him trying to get to the big leagues. So I, I loved it. I, I really did. I, I thought at that point in time, my only goal was to latch on with a major league baseball team. Little did I know then that I'd be so lucky to be with the Yes Network covering the Yankees for now nine seasons, which is wild to me. Well, you've been great all your whole life. And I want to say that one of my really good friends passed away, Richie Allen. Oh. And you, Richie passed away. And uh, I mean, he was a great Philly. Uh, he was probably one of the best. I, I mean, you're too young to re really actually to remember him. And you probably have seen films of him. Uh, you probably heard a lot about him. But this guy could hit a baseball as far, this guy could hit the ball as hard as anybody in the game of baseball. And he was just incredible. And also I played with his brother, Ronnie, Ron Allen. And he had another brother, Hank Allen. And they're all from the, I think the Reading area around that. Am I right? right? I'm gonna fact check some place, that. Some place up there. But I have a real good friend who was from Reading, Rocky Calavino. You remember Rocky Calavito? Vaguely. Okay. That's how old I am. <laughs> I thought he was great. I thought everybody would know Rocky Calavito. 
Wamberg, where is Wamp Wampum, Pennsylvania? You know where that is? That's near, uh, that's not too far from, I think, Milford, Pennsylvania. Milford, uh, Strauss, uh, East Stroudsburg. I think that's not, is that on the oh, eastern it, side? It's northwest of it. It's in between Pittsburgh and Youngstown. Oh, it is. Yeah, so it's on the, the western side of the yeah, state. Beaver's Fall, right? We're close, right? Yep. We're close. Near yeah, Beaver's Fall, near, uh, uh, well, I'm just like 600 miles away. That's where Joe's from. Yeah, same state, same, same state, right? Yeah, same <laughs> state. I used to play in Joe's golf tournament uh, up in Beaver's Fall, up in Newcastle. And okay. uh, we used to go up there, and Chuck Tanner was the uh, manager of the Pirates and all those guys. And uh, we had some really good times up in uh, Pennsylvania. But let me ask you a question now. And, you know, and us players, us older guys, like a Mickey Rivers and a Bucky Den and people like that, we do so many suites up in uh, up at, in uh, the city when the game's up there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see all the guys. We go down there and say hello to so-and-so. And then we go back up and go up into the suites. And uh, we always uh, – uh, everybody always has jokes. What's your uh, – what is your most, uh, uh, the funniest time that you're on the field? Or, you know, I mean, uh, there was there was always things that ball players always did. And, you know, I'm not gonna get involved in it, but this is what we used to do. And you had brothers and you knew what guys did and this is what it is. So uh, we had our fun. What is your most, what was your greatest memory? Uh, what was your, Okay, number one, what was your, I say the, what can I say? The uh, the favorite experience that you have had on the baseball field during well, the game? I think that it would probably be one that a lot of people remember in, oh geez, what is September? I believe one of the, say September 23rd or 24th, late September, 2014. Derek Jeter's final game. Derek Jeter, as we know, one of the most beloved Yankees out there that people have actually seen play. A lot of people grew up with Jeter. It was almost like their childhood was officially ending when he retired. And I remember back to that game and the Yankees were completely out of the playoffs at that point in time. It was a meaningless game in late September. David Robertson was the closer because Mariana Rivera had retired the year before. And that was that was a moment as well, if we're talking about moments when Derek and Andy Pettit come out and get the ball from Mo. I was standing in the third base camera well, and you were like, what's, ha what's happening right now? And, and that was a pretty awesome moment to witness it from that angle. Um, but as far as that day was concerned, I, I just remember that David Robertson had a, a great year for the most part as the closer and he blows a save in a meaningless game. And you're like, nah, can this happen? There's zero chance that this can happen. And you're like, well, maybe Jeter will get up. Maybe it can happen. And this man has lived such a charmed baseball life. And let's be honest, he worked for that. It's not like he just woke up one day and said, I want to play baseball. He certainly worked his tail off to achieve the things he did in the sport. But as he stepped to the plate, Yankee Stadium felt like it was a playoff game. It felt like it was a World Series game. The crowd was absolutely rocking. And, then, you know, he hits that ball to right field. And you're like, man, he just won the game. Like, that was it. That's a game-winning hit. That's how he ends his Yankees career. And I just remember the feeling of the crowd, the um, the excitement. I think Derek was almost in a little bit of disbelief that that had just happened and unfolded. September 25th, I was close. Um, that it had happened like that. And uh, I spoke to him after, and I was the first person to speak to him on the field. And if there's one thing we know about Derek Jeter, he is unbelievably composed all the time. He always knows what he's gonna say. He says the right thing. Uh, he's been a spokesman of the team for years. And you could tell he was a little shaken up. And it almost felt like he was going to start crying during the interview because he was so emotional from the day. And he told me that several times, throughout the game, he had to go down in that clubhouse, compose himself. He doesn't remember 
when he stepped into the batter's box with the bat felt like, like he barely remembered parts of the game because he was just so emotional about the entire experience. So uh, that's one that I'll definitely remember that I know a lot of people have seen doing that interview on the field after he hit that game winner. And I, I still know I asked him the first question. I don't remember what the question was at this point, but as soon as he spoke his first word and we're talking packed Yankee stadium, you could hear a pin drop. You could literally hear a pin drop. Everybody just wanted that last ounce of Derek Jeter. Anything they could hear him say, they were hanging on his last word. It was a pretty cool experience. That's really amazing. People don't realize when you, I had the opportunity when I got drafted by the Yankees, I got drafted number one in the country when I was 17 years old, came up to the bigs when I was 19 years old and coming up to uh, Yankee stadium and putting on the uniform and putting on the pinstripes. And that was the old stadium. That was the old, that was the stadium that Ruth built. Yeah. And, you know, when I first got uh, called up there, uh, being Jewish, when I got signed with the Yankees, there was like two, 3,000 people at the games. But when the game, when I started coming up, the, uh, the team started doing a little bit better. And, uh, but when I got on the uh, field and had my pinstripes on, and you look at the real monuments that not behind the fence, there was actually on the field, okay? And, you know, and when you're playing, when I was playing right field and Bobby Mercer was in center, and Roy White was in left, and, you know, and you look at Yankee Stadium, you see how big it was. You see the trains in back of you. Uh, I mean, it was just, and when you had a Phil Rizzuto, and then you had a, a a uh, 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 Frank Messer and a Bill White, uh, just like the Susan and the uh, Sterlings. I mean, people don't understand how electric fine uh, that experience. When you first went to Yankee Stadium, when you first got, let's say, called up to the bigs, and I'd say coming up to Yankee Stadium, was it electrifying to you when you got to Yankee Stadium and when you got to uh, do work for the Yes Network in Yankee Stadium? How did that feel great? Well, I have to dial it back a little bit further because my first time at the new Yankee Stadium was the 2009 World Series between the Phillies and the Yankees. I was actually actually covering the Phillies at the time, but I remember finding time, getting there extra early to go walk out to Monument Park and see all that because I hadn't actually, I was there earlier in the year, but that's the first time I was really there in a legitimate working capacity and I forget what game it was of the World Series but SNY at the time was looking for somebody from Philadelphia to do their wheelhouse show which was like a 30 minute debate show and I mean I'm in my early 20s at this point in time the place is packed and they asked me to do a live 30 minute ad lib show from the World Series at Yankee Stadium and I was like wow this is wild like this is my first foray into the New York market essentially I'm doing it during the World Series I'm doing something that I've always wanted to do so for me it was that moment it made it more special I had done work for ESPN at Citizens Bank Park and I had done work for other entities at Citizens Bank Park but something about reporting live during a World Series on the warning track of Yankee Stadium was unbelievably special, unbelievably nerve wracking and something I certainly will never forget. Sure. Now, my first day on the job at Yes Network, I had I was hired a little bit late. So I, I wound up going to spring training, but we weren't broadcasting that game. I was there for like one or two days. And again, one of the first people that came up to me was Derek Cheater. And he said, hey, Meredith, um, I'm Derek, just wanted to introduce myself. I know you're you're the new person for yes. I'm like, yeah, I know. If, if I don't know who you are, I'm really in bad shape for this, reason, <laughs> right? Like, holy crap. But it was just a nice gesture. I had covered the team in 2010 uh, for ESPN Radio New York. So I knew some of the guys on the team, but it was a really nice gesture. And then my first game for Yes Network, uh, Mariano Rivera blew a save. And it was like, hi, I'm Meredith. By the way, you're the greatest closer of all time. About that save you blew, game one against the Tampa Bay Rays at Tropicana Field, let's talk. Uh, so that was a little wild. But uh, as you know, just the amount of not only talent on the field on an active roster, but the amount of players that come back that are just elite players that you see and brush elbows with, it's something that's just 
remarkable, something I'm extremely lucky and blessed to be able uh, to meet some of you guys and, and to talk to some of you guys and have relationships with some of you guys. And, and that will always be special. And uh, I'm rambling on, Ron, but, you know, walking in, I sometimes look up and you see, you know, the sign in gold Yankee Stadium and you're about to walk in that press box. And I think to myself, damn, this is my home office. Like how bad could life be? Like, this is my office. So, uh, yeah. It's incredible. I, People don't realize it's, it's, you know, I mean, when I first, when I, uh, when I got to Yankee stadium and I was so young and, and, uh, uh that was a year that uh, Mickey was just going out and, uh, and I became real good friends with Mickey and, and Yogi and Whitey and these guys being from Atlanta, Georgia, being from the South and the South was all football. You know, you, I don't know if you're a football fan, you, you're a Penn State fan or University of Pittsburgh fan or whatever, okay? But uh, uh, baseball was not big till the Atlanta Braves came in from Milwaukee. And, and, and then it got a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger. But when I stepped, when I was 17 years old and when I first signed my contract with the Yankees and the first interview that I did up at the, in the press box was with Walter Cronkite. And oh I, you know, yeah, so he nervous? was my first guy. Yeah, he was my first guy. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing an a interview and I really, I've heard him before and I saw him on TV, but we had black and white TV. We, I mean, it was just like, you know, I mean, his voice was just incredible. And then that was a time that I got to meet uh, Scooter and uh, White and uh, Messer right. and sitting down and, and to be able to talk to these guys and and looking at the stadium from the press box, I said, this game is easy. Sitting up here, it's easy. The pitchers don't look like they're throwing hard enough to do anything. Uh, if you make an error, I see why the fans boo you because it looks too easy. People don't realize when you're in Yankee Stadium and, you, you know, and if you make an error and, you know, and, you know, and, and when you have to do some uh, uh, talking to people and, 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 and it's not the easiest thing to uh, introduce people with these uh, uh, names now. With you know, you got to really understand Spanish, and you got to talk like that. And you know, I asked David Cohen. I said, David, how in the world did you do that? He said, I don't know. I just uh, and David is just a natural at it. You know, oh, yeah. just like pitching. David's a natural. You know, I mean, Ron. he's such a great guy. He's a wonderful guy, and he's a great guy. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. I came, I came down because I wanted to meet Meredith to begin with. And Hi. Meredith, you should only know how Joe and Carmine and Lenny talk about you all the time. You are such a celebrity. I figured that this season killed him because there was limited spring training and then no regular season. And I know they take a lot of trips to Yankee Stadium. So I know I'm going to catch you hopefully this spring training. Oh, I'll be there too. Gotta watch all right. you guys. Come say hi for sure. Thank you. <laughs> Bye bye, Allison. Good talking with bye, you. Bye bye, bye, Happy Bye, thank you. But uh, but I see you out there, and you you're so calm, you're so professional, at it. and you know most people are not. And you know I have done a lot of uh, with uh, Kenny Main and and Chris Berman up in uh, with ESPN up in Bristol, and and to talk to these guys. But you are so professional, and you know it's amazing. And you know when. And not to get to, you know, not to really know you, just to see you out, you know, when I'm up in the press box, you're so professional at it. And, and the guys that you speak to and the Marcus uh, Tam uh, that, you know, down in fantasy camp, he said, God, Meredith is so easy to speak to. She's so great. She knows the game of baseball. She knows about this, about the cutoffs and this. And most girls don't know how to, you know, I mean, but it's really amazing. And, you know, I, I appreciate all your talent and it's, and you have major, major talent. Oh, and uh, okay. Well, we are trying to, as a group, women are, are trying to show that, Hey, we can talk baseball too. There's been hires throughout minor league baseball of women doing analyst work, play by play uh, reporters. So, you know, we're trying to eliminate the notion that we can't do it and we don't know the game because I think what you're learning over the years is we study just as much, we love the game just as much and we understand just as much as a lot of people out there. Now, I can't say that I ever played. I can't say that I was the first DH. I'm never gonna have that honor, um, but 
you know what, we try our best to to make sure that we're informed when we get there. So people find us trustworthy, players find us trustworthy, and they appreciate the work that we do. You know, all you can do is make sure you do your research, make sure that you're prepared, be over prepared. And that like that, when you do things like that, you're hopefully not going to fail, you know, that that allows you to be calm, that allows you to be professional when you're not frantic, like, oh, my God, what's this? What are we going to do? Do you like the analytics? Because when we played baseball, number one, I coaches, Elston Howard was our hitting coach. And the only thing Ellie knew how to do was stand at first base, be the first base coach. And the only thing he's, you know, we asked him, we're 0 for 10 and 0 for 12, 0 for 15. Ellie, what am I doing wrong? He said, look at the ball, you swing and you hit it. I was talking to Swish, okay? And I, I, I okay. And, and, Hold and, on, let me stop you. Have you ever met anybody with more genuine energy than Nick Swisher? No, no, I know his father real well, Steve, you know, and, and Swish is incredible. But he, he's, you know what? A lot of people, okay, but he's great for the game of baseball. Oh, he's wonderful. I love Swisher. He's one of my favorites. He's great for the game of baseball because he's true. He's yeah. true. And, you know, when we talk and, you know, he's down in fantasy camp and, and we talk a lot and, and, and he says, I said, what do you actually do after you hit when you're DH? He said, I'll just go down in the clubhouse. I'll go into the computer and I go watch the pitchers. And if I'm going to face this guy, I'll have a left-handed pitcher throw me in the uh, uh, underground in the uh, uh, batting cage, or I have a right-handed to throw to me. We never had any of that stuff, Meredith. Uh, I mean, only thing what we did, we had a baseball bat. You know, we'll go up in the clubhouse. Myself, people ask me, what did I actually do? You know, when I was the first DH in Boston against Tion, they said, you know, I was 34 degrees. It was freezing. And they said, what did I do? Ellie said, go up into the clubhouse, sit down, get out of the cold weather. I go up there, right? I sit down in my locker room, uh, right in my locker. Uh, uh, the guy is throwing some kibasis out there. I smell some kibasis. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. So I said, I'm going to eat a kibasi. And I'm, I'm sitting down, drinking a Diet Coke, eating kibasi, listening to the game on radio. There's no TVs. It's, it's uh, half an inning before I'm supposed to go at the bat. I go down there, go get a base hit by second time. I run up there again. I said, this can't be so bad. I mean, we get paid and we get paid nothing. I mean, we got nothing. Okay. So, but it's really amazing what they do now. And, and, you know, when people ask me, what do I think about what the DH, I said, you know, what the DH, you know, I mean, they go, they, Hey, they got all the modern technology and they could do this. They could do this. They could take BP. Uh, against right-handers, left-handers. Uh, they could uh, look at what they hit against this relief pitcher that might be coming in. We never had any of that. Everything was stored in our head. What do you think? Do you think analytics has taken away? Okay, this is very, uh, people, I ask people this. Do you feel like it's taken away a little bit of the real baseball game? Uh, I think it's such a complex question because there are a lot of areas where I think analytics are super beneficial in the sense of I was speaking to young pitcher on the Yankees Clark Schmidt the other day and he talked about working with the rep Soto working with all this next new technology tweaking his pitches in a way that he would have never been able to do before back in the day and I think it's a tool that can move guys to the next level I also think there's a fine line between using that tool to help you and letting that tool dominate your life. So I think some people get so caught up in some of the analytics stuff that you look at and some of the numbers you look at, they forget about the very thing you were talking about. See ball, hit ball, that simple. And then I think there are other areas of the game when you talk about, you know, shifting and what does that do to offensive players and some of the other things with analytics. I think there could be a marriage between old school and analytics. I yeah. think right now we're in a space in baseball where the pendulum has swung more towards analytics as opposed to eye test, old school scouts, see ball, hit ball. I think the perfect marriage is obviously somewhere in the middle where you use the analytics as an additional tool, but it's not the end all yeah. be all. And you do have organizations that do that to a degree. And then you have other organizations that let it completely dominate their every thought process. And I think fans 
get irritated at that in certain situations. You know, you look at the Tampa Bay Rays, they resorted to a lot of the things that they did that really was the trend setting moment with shifts, openers, all that, not because um, that's necessarily what they thought was best for the game. It was because they're a team with a low payroll that has certain abilities where they need to find every advantage to try to compete with big teams like the Yankees and the Red Sox. They were looking for any little edge and it wound up kind of transforming the game a, a little bit. So uh, do I love personally all the aspects of some stuff that goes on with analytics? Absolutely not. I, I do not at all. Uh, does anybody ask me? No, I have no say in how teams get run, you know? So I'm hoping that we see some type of an adjustment where you do rely a little bit on feel and the eye test and it's not like, okay, uh, you threw 96 pitches, or that's way too high. That would never even happen. Okay, you threw 70 pitches, you're out of there. It doesn't matter how you're throwing, what you're doing. It's th These numbers tell me that this happens, so you're out at 70. So I think there needs to be a, a little leeway there. I'm hoping we get to that point. But I understand both sides of it. I understand why people rely on the numbers so heavily and, and don't rely on feel. Um, and I also see why people that that only know that for the most part are like, I can't deal with this. This is too much. But you know what, talking about marrying the two together, you mentioned him earlier. Nobody does it better than David Cohn. Oh, nobody does. He does You're, it so well because some people yeah. don't really know all of the intricacies of it and, and what it means. He's able to kind of dumb it down for the population that doesn't get it and help you understand why teams would make decisions. And that's why uh, he's one of the best in the game and one of my favorites. I <laughs> know uh, it, you know, we're, we're one of the armchair uh, 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 students out there now when we're watching the games, we're the yep. older guys. We're looking at the older players, how we used to do it. I guess when we came up, you had the Mickey Mantles and the Yogi Bears and the Whitey Fords and, you know, it, it comes another group and we changed a few things. Uh, you know, we sit down and we'll look at this and we, you know, Joe Madden is a pretty good friend of mine. And, and uh, uh, when he started the, uh, the ship and uh, why in the world is this guy doing this? What, you know, and, and, and you know, you, you up in the press box and, and it's easy to look at where the fans say, why don't you just butt the ball down to third base? And when I was talking to Marcus down at Yankee Fantasy Camp, it's not that easy. Because, hey, when they, when they pitch into you, there's no way in the world that you're going to, you know, butt the ball down to third base or first base. It's, it's, it's impossible. You're not going to do that. It's twofold, too. Not only is it difficult, but also if you're known as a power hitter coming up through the minors, and even if you played collegiate ball or when you were younger, the emphasis wasn't on bunting past, you know, early, early on. If you were that guy that was known to hit home runs, it was power, 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 power. And we've seen that power gets paid it, it gets paid in the game. So you're seeing a lot of guys getting away from that and you're seeing organizationally moving away from small ball and bunting. So they don't have the skills that people think they have to be able to bunt and be comfortable in those situations. And then on top of that, I'll never forget this. Mark Teixeira said this, they do not pay me to bunt. If I bunt, they uh -huh. win, they win. They pay me to hit the ball over the fence. Me bunting is just allowing them to win. So will he hit it in the shift? God knows, 30, 40, 50% of the time, he's looking at the other percentage where he's hitting it out. So yeah. there are two ways to look at it. And I think people are infuriated by that very fact. You see the left side of the infield, it's completely open, just lay down, down a button. But if you haven't laid down a button in four years, that can't be easy. You would know better than me. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, I was scouting Mark Teixeira when he went to Georgia Tech. Of course, I was living in Atlanta. And then uh, at that time, uh, Mark Newman uh, asked me to uh, uh, go look at him at Georgia Tech. And I mean, I, re I mean, I thought he was a super hitter. I mean, he's, I mean, he's, he's such a, a gap to gap hitter, uh, hit the home run Yankee stadium. Perfect. Texas. Perfect. Uh, then when he came to New York, they paid him X amount of dollars to hit home runs and people don't realize. And I tell people, I said, he's not there to bunt. Number one, I, he probably maybe bunted three, four times in his whole life. And, you know, it's not easy to bunt when somebody's throwing 97, 98 miles an hour. It's a cut fastball. 
uh, you have to but you have to put the ball down between first and second and second and third. It's almost I mean it's people don't realize how really as tough it is. You know I'll go out to the ballpark if I have some stuff at the stadium with uh, do some stuff with uh, 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 you know uh, Samantha and uh, Andrew Levy and I'm up at the stadium and I'll go down there and, and watch the pitchers. Uh, 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 try to bunt. They'll bunt one or two pitches and they'll stop. They're not going to bunt anymore. They know people, you know, I mean, you have to look at it because you got the minor leagues. Well, you got height, you know, you got uh, a little league, you got the DH, you got uh, uh, Babe Ruth baseball, this DH, you got high school, you got college, you got 90% of minor leaguers. Uh, uh, it's, it's a DH. So these guys don't really even know how to pick up a bat. And the worst part about it, when they do pick up your bat, they pick up when we played, when the pitcher would uh, go up there and hit some BP, they'll pick up our gamers and we, uh, no, we'll, we'll get them out of there. We'll take our bats. But nowadays, these guys, you go into the clubhouse, you know, when I used to do uh, old Tonga's day and I used to always go in Derek's locker, you know, we had probably four or five bats in our locker. He had, it looked like uh, Modell. Yeah, you know, we had like 5,000 bats and 400 pairs of uh, shoes. We had one pair of shoes. We had four bats and we had a game uniform and that's all we had. But, you know, when somebody was going to use our gamer, somebody was going to use our gamer, we took that, uh, we take that uh, bat and, I mean, we run with it. We, we, I mean, the pitchers would usually uh, use that for a BP. But nowadays, I mean, uh, it's a total change game. You have seen the games change. Uh, you started when the game probably just started to change, uh, uh, and you have seen it now. And I tell people, I said it's going to it's going to uh, catch up. It's coming back. It's going to eventually come back to the real game of baseball. Ron, this is the control room. Yeah, you're off center. That was me calling you. Okay, well, my <laughs> yeah, you you were getting very enthused, which is a great thing. <laughs> But your okay, face but was anyway. like all over the place. Okay, but anyway, but <laughs> Meredith is so you know she's knowledgeable and, and, yeah. and no, no, it's, it's wonderful to talk to her because she knows the, really the game of baseball. And you know us as a fan, we're a fan now. Ooh. We are a we used to play, but we are a fan. I'm a fan of Meredith's now. Okay, her mom and dad, and she's too young, but her mom and dad probably. If they were baseball fans, they probably saw us play in this in 76 and 77. Mm -hmm. And they probably knew about us. And they remember Connie Mack Stadium down in, in Philly. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. They remember Connie Mack Stadium. But uh, uh but you know, it's it's nice to be able to talk to somebody that really knows the game. And she knows the game. I mean, you know, you can see so many great things that you're going to eventually do in the game of baseball. You know, I mean, you're going to, you know, you're going to have a lot of opportunities, Meredith. I mean, you know, being, oh, you do, you will. I mean, hey, hey, you know, look what, hey, you, you earned it. You know, I mean, hey. Thank you. You, you, I saw on her Instagram today that she was hinting about taking Michael Kay's place one day in the no, booth. No, 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 no. Let's <laughs> not start any controversy. I will tell you, somebody asked me, I did a story session the other day, and they said, will they ever let you fill in for Michael Kay? And I sure. said, we shall see. Absolutely. Uh, they shall, I wouldn't say no, but Michael is the king of the hill when it comes to the Yes Network and does such a phenomenal job. I'm sorry. The play -by -play guy. <laughs> Lenny's trying to start Stuff. Look at this. Hey, Look at this. Trying to start stuff. Meredith, we started together. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Michael, you know, he was a kid when I was playing. And, you know, he came up to me the first time he saw me. He said, you know, I, I try to imitate you. You know, I mean, with your bat and your, you know, how hard you hit the ball, how far you hit the ball and this, and you use your bat, da, 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 like this. And it's, it's amazing. People don't realize you do get old. You do. <laughs> you played baseball. You never thought you're going to take the uniform on, take it off. You never think that. You never think that, you know, after your career is over with, you have to start a new life. You know, unfortunately, when we played, we didn't have collecting, but we didn't have any of the free agency. We didn't have any of that stuff. So, I mean, most of the guys, most of the guys on my team had second jobs. You know, they worked at, you know, they sold cars. 
They sold cars. Wild. They, uh, uh, they worked down at Barney's uh, 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 a men's store. They had to do that. I mean, people don't didn't realize you're making twelve, fifteen hundred dollars a month, and you made seven dollars a day, and that was a lot of money back then when you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars. But it's not enough to save. Okay, but you know, I mean, but my second job, I was very lucky. You know, being Jewish, I was very lucky to uh, to to speak at every bar mitzvah and did every wedding and lit every candle at every bar mitzvah. And I was related to every uh, 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 Jewish kid that had a bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah. And at every wedding, I just lit a candle and they gave me my $250 what I made that day. <laughs> That's what, what I did. Well worth it though, because think about oh, what, no. it, no, what an inspiration you were to all of those kids. You know what I oh, mean? No, no, like, no, no, you're, no. you're a Jewish role model to them. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm, you know what? Let me tell you something. I tell these people. I said, 42 million people out of work. People are hurting. People are really, I mean, it's going to be worse. I saw where the mayor is going to uh, 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 shut, shut down the city for another it. month. He's going to shut it down for another run. month. <laughs> I know it. It's going to kill it. It's going to kill it. And what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do is give the people and smile. And if, if it wasn't for Lenny or Joe, I had no idea how to do any of this stuff. And, you know, and it's, look what I got. I still got my flip phone. I still got my phone. And this is like, <laughs> it's Ernie has one too. One. John has one. But you Who have else? a computer too. So you're ahead of the curve. Oh, yeah, but wait a second. But I have to have people to help me to put on my computer. And yeah, he tells me, what do I do? I don't know how to do any of this stuff. Wait, I still got my calculator. <laughs> I still got my calculator. I still got my rotary phone at home. This is me. Here's the thing though, are, are you enjoying it though? Or do you like the media world now that you're in it? It's a lot different. I wish I was sweating. I wish I was running around the bases. I wish I was being booed. I wish I was being cheered. I wish I was uh, uh, up at Yankee Stadium, uh, meeting people and talking to people. Do I like it? I like it because I meet people like yourself. I meet people because I can meet the fans. I can help people. Instead of doing the first response, giving food out like uh, uh, Ray Negron and uh, Steve of uh, Carol, and they go out and you know CC, they give food out. They living up in New York. I wish I was doing that. I, I, I mean, I love doing stuff like that. I love you know uh, going to Yankee Stadium and and they give Christmas presents to uh, poor kids that uh, are in the neighborhood or you know, and just give them a jacket or a toy or something. I'd love to do that. You know, I grew up, I was very lucky. I grew up, my parents had no money, okay? And I grew up where, you know, I listened to my mom and dad all the time. And they always told me what goes around comes around. And that's what I did, Meredith. And, and, uh, and that's why I like to give back. And having people like yourself, and these people love you. And they really do. You have, you know, seriously. I mean, hey, I can shoot the bull and whatever. I'm not going to do that. I, hey, I've been booed in front of 50,000 people. One or two more doesn't make a bit of difference to me. <laughs> and you know, I don't care. You know, I mean, when you played in New York, oh, you yeah. gotta have, uh, you gotta have, you got your blood has to be pretty thick. Okay. Yeah. So uh, to meet people like yourself and see you starting off 10 years ago and what you are now, uh, it's it's a major accomplishment. And, you know, you, you know, you should be very proud. I know people tell you this all the time. You should be very proud. Being a professional baseball player, that's what I was, okay? I never had anybody as professional as you down on the field because we never had any of that stuff. But having somebody like yourself and then come into the clubhouse and know the guy when you could talk to him or when you can't talk to him. And mm -hmm. you know the guy when he's mad you know the guy when he's really will say something bad and you knew you know to walk away and people don't realize that people go up to him if you have a bad ball game you you know uh you, you struck out with the base load you lose you you know you gave up a home run you chaplain gave up a home run to uh what's his name and and you know i guarantee you there's so many reporters why did you do that what happened you know like that they don't understand an athlete they don't understand when you reach your peak and then you lose your peak and you have to come in that clubhouse and you have to not answer live in Atlanta where you have one paper that's all you have is one paper but you have a hundred papers and you have a 10,000 reporters up in New York and you have it all over the world all over the country and this is what it is 
it takes a special person to do it. And you know the guys, and you know the guys when you can talk to them, you know when you better not talk to them, you know when to be easy on a question, am I right? I think there's a way to ask questions Correct. and people may not love it in the moment, but the facts are the facts. So like you said, if somebody strikes out with the bases loaded, you have to ask the question. Oh, you gotta ask them. But there's a way to ask it, right? Correct. Not, hey, Correct. you suck, why did you strike out? <laughs> yeah. I noticed you took blah, blah, blah. And were, were you looking, were you fooled on fastball? You know, there's a, there's a way to ask it that doesn't fire them up as much. Uh, as opposed to going right in and saying you're garbage, why were you why were you up in that situation? You know, like that's tough for anyone to hear, especially when they're heated. And you know, not all the time uh, are people going to be happy with you. There there are going to be times when people are going to be annoyed with you. And there have been times where you know it was a heated moment and you had to ask something and and somebody had an issue with it and you squash those issues the next day or very soon thereafter and oftentimes in the heat of the moment people realize hey like you were trying to do your job we're just trying to do our correct job. So correct I think overall in that clubhouse at least I hope anyway that guys know that it's not I think with some people it becomes vindictive and it becomes. Um, baiting if that makes sense people try to bait people correct um i think if they know you as somebody that's not trying to necessarily bait them but you're sticking to facts you're asking about what happened in the game you can only get so mad at that and you know what at the end of the day if somebody's a little uh, has their feathers ruffled a little bit it is what it is but i think that's where the relationships come into play and they know what you're about and they know uh the way you conduct yourself and i think it's just it's part of the gig right you'd love everybody to like you all the time but you have to be aware that work like that people might not love you right let me so. give you an example uh i'm doing a book about my roomie uh thurman was my roommate for four years okay I wish uh, I was it's it's you, it's coming out in april 2021 it's called the captain and me on and off the field uh it's it's going to be an unbelievable book people don't realize and i did everything with him we came up together he was an i was a number one in 67 he was a number one in 68 we became friends and i don't know if you ever remember the movie bang the drum slowly is that okay go home just look at netflix i think you were like it's a great baseball movie am i right lenny or joe it's, you know, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great I movie. I watched this the other day and I was embarrassed that I hadn't seen it yet. Which one? I think that what you were just talking about. Bang, Bang the, the drum, drum slowly? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Richard De Niro? Yes, I think, I believe so. Somebody was just telling me about it the other day and they're like, you haven't yeah, seen I that? Actually I actually think the same as Robert De Niro. Robert, Robert De Niro. I knew it. Hey, I'm not good with this. I, hey, come on, cut it out. Let I'm not good with it anyway. I know, he's, he's killing me, he's killing me. But anyway, but we lived, we did things. It's, it's, it's not a baseball book. It's, it's really a book that a person came up together. We became very good friends. Mm -hmm. I had, when I played Meredith, I had a lot of injuries when I played. And, you know, I mean, uh, I wasn't one of these guys that lifted weights after and before game. Uh, we didn't have that growing up. We had to do construction when we exercise. We'll go down to spring training. We got in shape down in spring training. Not like these guys, they, they look like Zeus when they come off, they take their shirts <laughs> off and they, you know, you know, you can put grease on them. You could, you know, get muscles, you know, whatever. Okay. And, you know, I mean, we had to work. Okay. And, you know, and it wasn't easy. I mean, it wasn't really when you got injured and, you know, and uh, I got injured and Thurman was very lucky that Thurman didn't get injured a lot. So, I mean, he took up for me and, you know, I had Ralph Houck and, uh, Bob Lemon and Billy four times and and it wasn't easy to play in New York and you know you come down to the ballpark every single day and and you know and uh, only thing you can do is actually go, get in the tub back then oh, we had a whirlpool that's the only thing we did and yeah. we and they put soap in the whirlpool I don't know they do that you know they put the soap in the whirlpool and it goes about 15 feet over your head that's the only <laughs> thing they had so they wrote on the uh, whirlpool USS Bloomberg and that's what they did because I lived in the tub and that wasn't easy. It was very difficult to do where you wanted to play. But, you know, we didn't have this modern technology where Timmy uh, Lyric, you know, I mean, is a real good friend of mine. And, and I said, Timmy, I said, what can you do for my shorty? He said, well, you would operate it and you would have been perfect. Your real I mean, good friend is Jim Jimmy, Jimmy. 
No, no, Timmy. 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 Oh, Tim, Tim is Lynch. a head trainer with the Yankees. Tim Lynch. Tim Lynch. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he took uh, Donahue's place. But anyway, yeah, I'm allowed to say uh, this because without me, he has no social media. Oh, okay, man. but anyway, but anyway, it was very, it was, Meredith, it was Come very up, hard. It was very hard every single day to do it. Yeah, it was, it was hard every single day to do that. So I mean, hey, uh, you know, you know, I mean, people, you know, hey. After I used to work out, I stayed down in the stadium, then uh, went up to the, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, up in the press box and sat with the riders. And then I go down to the, down to the game after the game was over with. And, you know, I, I was ostracized, you know, why you're here, you're not going to play. So it's very, very difficult. But, uh, but anyway, Meredith, I mean, you're the best. I mean, Wait, you're really so when, does it, when is it out? Uh, it's coming out April, 2020. I just found out today, it's uh, had a big thing. Uh, the, uh, the Daily News is doing a whole big feature on it. Will you and do I just found that out. Will you do me a favor? Yes. When I get my copy, will you sign it for me? It, oh, Meredith, anything for you. And But when I see you, you know, don't say, you know, I, I, I will give it to you and, and, and uh, say, hi, that's all I want. You know I mean? You know, hey. Hi, you know, we're getting a picture. We're holding the book. You're signing the book. <laughs> it all. Anything, hey, anything for you, anything. Hey, for you. I do have a question because I know your buddy is with Mickey, right? Yeah, Rivers. Yeah, do yeah. you know okay, what? that I'm on his women's fantasy camp team? No, you're not. Are you playing with oh. Jennifer? It's Jennifer plays, right? Jennifer had played, but she's not on Mickey. She got hurt, didn't she? Jennifer she got, got hurt. hurt. First year, yeah. No, the last yeah. couple years I've been with Mickey, and I was just seeing if he gave you any type of a scouting report. He did. He told me I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> was no, it bad? He did. Was it bad? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to tell you honestly. Mickey told me, and I, I, I spoke to Mickey. Probably, maybe Mickey's in Cleveland right now with Cookie. You know, Cookie, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, He's with Cookie. Oh, you, of course. And he said. She could play. She's a good athlete. Uh, she could hit the ball a long ways for a woman. But he, <laughs> but she said, but he said she could play. And uh -huh. you know, I mean, for Mickey, well, Mickey will, you know, I always ask Mickey. Mickey's one of my best friends. I mean, he's one of my closest. I gotta call him. I haven't called him in a while. I gotta call Mickey. He's in Cleveland. And yeah. he's sleeping like 20, 23 hours a day. He <laughs> left the villages. You know, he was at the villages with Jimmy. He was with Jimmy down at the villages. He left the villages. He took a train. He wouldn't fly. Oh, you know, I love him. Of course, him. he doesn't fly anywhere. Yep. And you know, and you know, and then he came up to uh, New York. Uh, Andrew Levy got his stuff out of the uh, out of his uh, 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 apartment, and then they took a train to Cleveland. And I said, oh, I said, what are you going to do in Cleveland? I said, Cleveland is probably one of the ugliest cities you have ever seen. I said, you never see the sun in the uh, uh, fall or winter time. And it's cold there. It's miserable. And you know, he said, "Well, we don't." Be he said, "I'll stay in the apartment for like 23 hours a day." I said, "And, and then what he does? Wait a second. I'm going to tell you what he does. I don't know if you knew this. He buys his uh, number tickets. You know, he buys tickets. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he has to, you know, he has to buy his uh, lottery stuff every single day. And I said, Mickey, you ever won anything? He said maybe three, four dollars. I said, how much money have you spent? He said, a lot of money. He said, well, that's better than losing in one track meet uh, down at the track. He said, I could play, I could play uh, the numbers every single that's day. Life by Mickey, he's spacing it out. He knows he can Is he do the best? Day. Wait a second. Is he the best? Oh my God, I love him. I absolutely love him. He's a wonderful dude. Him and I get along so well at Women's Fantasy Camp. We all have a good time. Uh, I'm usually his first base coach. He tries not to yell at me, but he'll yell at the rest of them. Keeps him oh, in yeah. line. Mickey runs a tight ship. Oh yeah, no, no. Who's his coach with him? Uh, it's just him and I. Oh really? You know, yeah. Oscar used to do it before he passed away. No, I-, I Oscar I, didn't do it? No, no, no. I think it's just, I can't, I'm trying to think. There's somebody, but he's not really a coach. He's just a catcher. Helper. Oh. Who's your helper? Um, oh God, Ricky, the catcher is, but he was never like a. Not Ricky Ware. Catcher. Ricky Ware? No. No, not Ricky Ware. A catcher? No, but he, he never played for the Yankees. He's just like a helper. Is, uh, uh, Dave DeMaio? He's down there too. He helps Yeah, Dave out. is down there. Dave's sweet. Uh, oh yeah, he's, he has the smallest body. 
He has his smallest legs. Very compact, him. right? Oh yeah, no, he looks like a little lad tattoo. But he has, long, tattoo. he has a long torso though, but a small body. Yeah, he has a big head and a little body. And I look at him and every time I see him, Meredith, every time I see him, I said, you know, you can smaller. Every time I used to go old timers with Yogi, I, I started with Yogi. Yogi was like about five, seven. Then he got to like the four, eight, the last time I saw him. <laughs> oh my God. But let me tell you something. Uh, Demaya is funny. Oh, uh, he's I'll, sweet. I'll, he's one of the sweetest guys ever. What a good dude. Good yeah, dude. coming. Well, unfortunately, you didn't do it. Are we? Year, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't think we're going to have, uh, you think we're going to have it next year? No, I, don't I don't think, think so, so, unless they do something like early on in the off season, maybe if everything's back to normal, maybe they'll do it in November. Cause I know they do a small like family camp in November. No, not maybe anymore. They'll do, With maybe the kids. They'll, yeah. Maybe they'll do two men's and women's next year. So you if, talk to Julie or do you talk to Amy Sue? Both of them. Oh, you talk to both of them. Okay, yeah. fine. So when you go down there, you're down there for a week. You stay at the Sheraton too, or do you uh, go out? I live down here, so I stay. Oh, here. so you live in Clearwater, <laughs> right over Causey Causeway? Uh, not too far. Yeah, by the beach. I live okay, by the beach. Do you fish? Let me. Do you fish? <laughs> oh my goodness, do I fish? Have you not been? And of course, you haven't been checking my Instagram. No, no, no. So you fish? I gotta tell you, I caught a grouper the other day. No, you didn't. Did you? The right home about. Let me. No, tell how you. big? Uh, it was like 30, 35 inches, maybe. About fifteen pounder. Uh, 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 what did you catch? Your, uh. Uh, felt a heavy. red or a brown one? Uh, it was a brown one. Catch a brown one. Do you yeah. ever, do you ever go out with a uh, 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 Penella in his boat? No, you know what? I haven't seen Lou, good old sweet Lou, since he stopped working for the Yes Network. And before he left the Yes Network, he said he was going to take me on his boat, and I haven't been able to take him up on it. So if you get down here and you go on Penella's boat, you better let me know. Yeah, no, 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 I will. Uh, do you? Uh, do you fish out in the uh, uh, sound or do you go uh, uh, out a little bit farther for your grouper? You could uh, catch your uh, grouper a yeah, half a mile out. Yeah, the Gulf. We're about nine miles out usually. Yeah. Hold on. Let's see if I can get you a picture. Oh, I got to see it. I got, oh, was, was it red or brown? It was brown. Hold on. My son just bought a boat. He lives down, he's a doctor down in uh, Miami. Oh. And uh, he's, uh, uh, so uh, marlin if, fishing down there. Oh yeah, no, no, no. He hasn't gone out to Bimini yet. He doesn't have the. He has a. Uh, he just bought a thirty-five foot boat, and uh, um, oh me, where did you catch him, Meredith? Where did you catch him? Told you about nine miles out. Did you eat him? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was great. Did you cut the meat? Did you uh, did you fillet it? Or had somebody do it for you? Well, you know, I'm. You gotta tell I'm, me. You know how to do it? No. I'm working oh, on it. You're on Instagram, Ron. I'm sorry you have I'm surprised you I'm, haven't seen this. I'm working on it. Uh, I did eat it, though. And man, was it delicious. I still oh. have some in my freezer. I have some in my freezer yet. What else did you catch? Did you catch um, uh, mangrove snapper. Yeah. Some... Yellowtail snapper, too, right? No, no yellowtail. Uh, sheep's head. We got some sheep's head. All oh, the way out there, nine miles out, you did? Normally, well, you get those we, by the snook. We take by the, uh, by the bridges. We keep we take a couple uh, pit stops, you know, see what's yeah. out there. I've caught in the past some kingfish, some bonnethead sharks, which are actually quite delicious in a like really? fish taco. Yeah, you caught some king mackerel. How about Spanish and all that stuff? Uh, yeah, I just love that. I love that. Yep. You know, do you ever? Let me ask you a question, Meredith. Do you ever get down to Miami? So my brother went to the University of Miami back in the day. So my, I, my son's a team doctor down there for University of Miami. What are you talking about? The U? Whoa, how do I not know that? I, I go to every single game down there. No, I mean, no. hey, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, yeah, uh, my son graduated from Miami. What and year? He, uh, gosh, he's 44, so uh, he went to University of Miami undergrad, and he went to medical school there, and he went to Harvard for four years. Now he's a doctor, and are you familiar with Holly, uh, Hollywood? Hollywood? Yeah. yeah, he's at Memorial. Okay. Uh, he's down there with Dr. Arebi. You ever heard of Dr. Arebi? I have indeed, yes. Okay, Dr. Arebi. And uh, he goes to every single game. I mean, I go to every single game. Mark Rick is a real good friend of mine who's a head coach down there. Manny Diaz is, you know, I go to every game. I go, no. I go to all of them. And, you know, I mean, he lives right, you know where the diplomat is, the hotel? Diplomat. 
Yeah, right on the beach. Right on the beach, Hollandale Beach. It's right on uh, the beach. It, but anyway, but anyway, uh, okay. It's uh, uh, it's south. It's it's south of uh, 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 Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. And he goes out there. He goes out there every week. Uh, he takes his family. I got two grandkids. They love the fish now. His wife loves the fish, and they send me back. Uh, they caught like a uh, uh, let me see about a ten pound grouper, oh, uh, nice. and they they fish about a half a mile away from the shore. And they found a spot where they're uh, 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 stuff. The rocks and stuff. Yeah, a lot of rocks. And they found what, people throw beds down there. They throw old cars down there. He found it. I said, you better not tell anybody. And he yeah, found right? a place and it, he kills them there. So he kills them. So I'll, I'll awesome. talk to you hopefully during the season. And of if course. you get down there, is your brother living down there now? He's in uh, West Palm right now, but he still has a place in South Beach. So okay, South Beach. Okay, near the Durrell. Uh, no, uh, south of Fifth. So okay, near. Uh, okay. On the beach, on the actual beach. He's like south I, of, by Joe's Stone Crab. You know where Joe's is? Oh, I go all the time, every day. Yeah, he's right I, around I, there. I, I get the colossals. <laughs> oh, they're so good. <laughs> they're so good. <laughs> we're talking. We're talking a fish. You know, we can always. Hey. If it's, it's baseball or food, that's all we talk right. about. How about it? Meredith, you know, I know you're tired. You, 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 well, you, you've been Meredith, doing stuff. Hey. Uh, I have a quick question. What are sure. your thoughts on the current Yankees? Do you think they're going to make any trades? Uh, are they going to get rid of anyone that we like, in your professional opinion? I would say, obviously, as we know, it's been publicized everywhere. I spoke to Brian Cashman last week for Yes Network for a hot stove show for about 15, 20 minutes. And first priority is DJ LeMahieu. They want DJ LeMahieu back. Uh, will they be able to come to an agreement on money and years? I think at the end of the day, it's going to get done. This free agency period, because of everything that's happened with COVID, is kind of moving slow. I just think it's more of a waiting game and a patience thing. And I know fans do not want to hear that. They're like, why can't you just do it now? Uh, but why overpay for someone if you don't have to? I, I think he's certainly the Yankees have discussed things with him and he's going to see who else is out there and what he could potentially get. But at the end of the day, I think they're going to find a way to make that work. Now, as far as trades are concerned, you look at their rotation and I don't think if they sign LeMahieu, they're going to be able to afford Masahiro Tanaka. I don't know if Masahiro Tanaka is part of the picture at all, even though he's had a lot of success and he's been unbelievably consistent for the most part for the Yankees. I just don't know that they're going to be willing to give him the money that he's going to command in free agency. So I think they're going to have to look at alternative options and they can say all day long that they feel comfortable with some of the youth. And while I know they're excited about a lot of the youth, would they like to have a veteran arm in that rotation for a little security? Would they like to have a more experienced arm to add some depth? I think they're going to find a way to do something. So much of it right now, though, hinges on DJ LeMahieu, and they really need that chip to fall because I think there are contingency plans. So many fans are talking about, well, just go get Lindor. Well, it's great. Go get Lindor. I'd like $5 million. Buy me a place on the beach, too. Like, it doesn't work like that. We could all say we want this, but it may not be realistic. Uh, to get Lindor, not only are you going to have to give up personnel in prospects, but you're going to have to pay him as well. So you're essentially paying him twice because he's not even in his free agency year. So via trade and then via free agency, if he's going to be here long-term. So uh, while I'd like to see it, I think it's something to consider. I think Brian Cashman has proven over the years that he does a nice job finding kind of some diamonds in the rough or some reformation projects that could potentially help when it comes to the bullpen and the rotation. But I don't think they're going to do or can do much of anything until they get a final decision on DJ LeMay here. Thank you. It was, it was interesting that um, Boone today said LeMay is the number one priority. I'm assuming that was with Cashman's okay. Lenny, did you not watch Hot Stove two weeks ago? I had Boone on. He said, yeah, we're bringing on LeMay here. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, Lenny. <laughs> But he said it again today. Yeah, he no, he did. He did say it again today. Cashman said it on our show. I mean, it's it's been a, a fairly known thing. But yes, you're right to hear him actually say it and be vocal about it is just another push to hey, we want this guy. But I, I and getting are two different things. Yeah. And 
I think DJ does indeed want to be back. He was comfortable in New York, loved playing in New York. His teammates love him. There's no reason not to bring him back unless another team blows him away money and years wise that it just doesn't make sense. You think Clint Frazier is going to be a regular this year? As long as he, you know. I mean, I think he's earned the right to get the opportunity. And I think coming into this spring training, he's further ahead than he's ever been. You look at the body of work last year, the defense improved. The offense, for the most part, was there. And he's shown that he can play left field and right field, which is certainly beneficial. I think you look at going into last year, it was like maybe Frazier – Mike Talkman had a nice year the year before, but Talkman really struggled last season. And you don't know if that's because of everything surrounding the way this season went down. Uh, But I think he's certainly above Talkman at the moment. We don't know what's going to happen with Gardner, if he's going to play into this at all. But I would say the days of Giancarlo Stanton playing in left field, unless it's an emergency, slim to none would be my immediate thought and if that's the case it looks like left field is clint frazier's to lose at the moment based on the roster and the way it's configured right now thank you thank you well i would like to have you in the lineup uh meredith and uh uh, what mickey said about you i think you uh could be very consistent and you might be the missing link (laughs) Oh, <laughs> thank you. Hopefully this is the year. Fingers crossed. There's yeah. a ring involved, right? <laughs> Meredith, I know you're tired. You've been doing stuff. Thank you very much for doing this. I really, from the bottom of my heart, I really thank you. I know my fans are, I know baseball fans all, all across the country. They love talking to you. Uh, what you have done for the game of baseball is incredible. And whatever, you know, if you ever need me to do anything, you just let me know I'm here for you. And I know things will get better. And every time I uh, think about the ocean, I'm going to think about you being nine <laughs> miles out and you found a nice reef to fish oh, off of. <laughs> and you caught some beautiful fish. And you, all of a sudden you, you, you got some ballyhoo on your uh, a bait or, you know, you got some squid down there and you got that big thing coming up and it's, Hey, let me tell you something. You catch some big groupers. You catch like 40, 50 pounders. You know, you could catch them. And some amberjack down there. Oh, that's Okay, so here's what's going to happen. Next time, well, no way Mickey's getting on a boat, right? He won't get on a boat. No, no, he won't get on a boat. No, he's hardly get on a dock. Next time you are down, Gator's down. We're we're doing a fit. We'll get Penella. I'll I'll get Penella. I'll get Penella. And, you know, he has his own captain. He has a 65 he has a 65 foot boat. Oh, that's it. Wow. He really yeah, he has a 65 boat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, we'll fish. Hey, when we're down there, we'll fish. I love it. Hey, I love it. hey, thank you very much. Love you, girl. And thank you very much for doing this. And like I said before, I wish you only the best and everything like that. Thank and you're the best. Hey, you're going to be on top real soon. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everyone else out there that watched this and have a happy holiday season. Be safe, everybody. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll take that selfie at the stadium soon. Oh, I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) Good night. Good night.